headquartered in Washington, D.C., and it's our pleasure to host you this evening for an interesting, informative, and meaningful conversation. I'm going to ask you to put into the chat your name, your state, if you like, your congregation, and perhaps a land acknowledgement, or perhaps your pronouns, to sort of do that UU roll call that we like to do at many UU Unitarian Universalist events. The per main purpose of this is so that our guests this evening, Zena Regis and Reverend Ashley Deterbert, Deterbert, Bert, have a sense of who's in the room with them. So I would appreciate it if you started doing that. Please put your name and your state in particular, your congregation, your preferred pronouns, and perhaps a land acknowledgement. For example, I reside in Washington, and USJ is headquartered on the in DC, and that is the traditional and historical lands of the Piscataway peoples. I prefer pronouns. My preferred pronouns are he, him, and L, if you really want to get on my good side. And I happen to be a member of the All Souls Church Unitarian in Washington, DC. So that is where I go for pastoral care and for replenishment of my soul in the work that I do day in, day out with you use. That's where I go to be a regular human being in the pews. The other, the other thing that I'd like to say at this early portion of our evening is please remember to keep yourself on mute if you are not speaking. When we get to the question and answer portion of the evening, I will happily invite people to be brave and raise their hand and be acknowledged and ask a question. And uh, I will try with the assistance of Ashley Egan, who's somewhere here, to shepherd questions from the chat. We will do our best, but we're human, so we may not be perfect. And I would be remiss if I didn't remind everyone to either tune in via webcast or to join me in Washington, D.C. on Saturday, June 29th, when UUSJ will be present with the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. We want to showcase our solidarity and reiterate the commitment that UUSJ and the UUA have had with the Poor People's Campaign since 2018. So if you happen to be in the Amtrak corridor or in coal and tobacco company, uh, country or uh, right in the greater metropolitan area of DC, I invite you to think seriously about a day trip. If you are not capable of doing a day trip, that's totally understandable, but then please consider joining the UUSJ watch party for the Poor People's Campaign and or watching it yourself online in your loans. I think it'll be more fun with us we have Reverend Connie Yost from Oregon, who's going to be holding ground. And I'm going to do some silly organizer stuff, like try to call in live from the, uh, the, the rally. But if that's not your jam, then please at least tune in. And please do make sure that you register and RSVP so that the Poor People's Campaign is clear that Unitarian Universalists are among their strongest supporters. So with that, and a final reminder to please put in the chat your name, your state, your preferred pronouns, a land acknowledgement, and to mind your mic, I would like to invite to the spotlight the Reverend Ashley Dittar Burt, am I? Burt, who is the program manager at the State Action Network of New York. So for those who don't know, UUSJ is 
happily engage with multiple state action networks across the country. We join the QSANS, that's the coalition of all UU state action networks. And I want everyone to know that you have wonderful state action networks out there across the land. And um, if memory serves properly, the New York State Action Network is among the oldest and most effective over time. So with that, I invite Reverend Ashley to take the spotlight. Good evening, everyone. As Pablo said, my name is Reverend Ashley D. Tarbert. My pronouns are she, her, and I come to you today from New York City, which is the land uh, historically of the Muncie Lenape. It's great to be with all of you today. Friends, we come together to light our chalice. On this night, we come together to learn more about honoring ourselves and each other in life and in death. We know that although we are all different, all unique, all special, the one certain thing we have in common is that one day we will die. And though this may be a difficult thing to come to terms with, we come together knowing that each and every one of us deserves the opportunity to die with dignity. And so tonight, we come together to learn. We come together honoring the 1988 general resolution called the right to die with dignity. This resolution called for examination of, quote, attitudes and practices in our society relative to the ending of life, as well as those in other countries and cultures. It advocated for self-determination in dying. It sought safeguards so that no one's life would be hastened without their consent and desire. It aimed to honor the inherent worth and dignity of people and their choices, even when they reach the end of their days. We come together to examine and better understand. We come together in the legacy of this resolution, as well as the continued work around end of life options by Unitarian Universalists all over this country. We come together knowing that this issue is very much a human issue. We come together in the name of the diverse group of humans who are able to exercise choices in their deaths. And there are so many stories that exist, some that we may know ourselves and some that we have yet to hear. And so we hear stories like that of Myra Shulman, whose mother Beverly, a white former educator and museum worker, went on countless road trips with her family between her diagnosis of terminal colon cancer and her choosing to pass away in her California home on her own terms with her family by her side. We hear stories of that, like that of Jean Hughes, a white disability activist who once declared, my life's value cannot be diminished by medical aid in dying. To the contrary, my life would be empowered by the passage of the Medical Aid and Dying Act. And we hear stories like that of Anthony Randolph, a black New Yorker whose thoughts on death changed dramatically after seeing his Marine brother's agonizing death and thinking, it didn't have to be like this. While they all reach the same point, their journeys are specific to their circumstances. And these are but a few examples of the rich tapestry of stories woven around end of life options. In hearing them, may we remember the people and their humanity in life and in death. 
they, much like us, are all part of one community, but the perspectives they bring to that community are rich and varied. By lifting up their stories and the stories of so many like them, we honor their legacies as we consider our own. Friends, we come together in recognition of our interdependence, how we live together and support each other in death. We come together in recognition of our pluralism, the diversity of experiences and perspectives that we all bring to this. We come together in recognition of justice, creating a world in which all have the freedom to choose what their end of life may look like. We come together in recognition of our transformation, how we transform in life and how we may transition into death. We come together in recognition of our generosity, the love we give to each other as we have difficult talks, make difficult choices, and ultimately leave this earthly plane. We come together in recognition of equity, the hope that all may be able to make choices that work best for them. And so friends, as we light this chalice tonight, We do so coming together in the name of love. May this light be a reflection of our community and our love. Blessed be. Thank you so much for that, Reverend Ashley. That was beautiful and a really wonderful reminder that Unitarian Universalists have been on this journey of learning around end of life options since more or less the start of the national conversation, um, which I'll be candid. I was surprised to learn when Zena uh, approached me about how UUSJ could help lift up the current state of play for these issues among UUs and informed me of our own uh, commitment and statement on the issues. So with that in mind, I really do want to participate in the learning journey, experience and hold with seriousness the nuance that Reverend Ashley shared for us. And I would like to invite Zena Regis the Director of Faith Engagement for Compassion and Choices to speak to us this evening. Zena is an amazing personality. I've really enjoyed getting to know her in preparation for this event. Prior to joining Compassion and Choices, she was a chaplain and is also a playwright. So, I'm sorry, I thought, I thought she was a playwright. <laughs> Excuse me if I misstate that. No, I no? Yeah, that's right. Hey, my dad was, uh, he tried to be a playwright. So I'm, I'm sympathetic to those who try to put pen to paper in the creative space. Um, and so with that, I give you Zena to share with us and elucidate some of the nuance in this issue. Thank you, Zena. Take it away. Absolutely. Hello, everyone. I'm going to share my screen. Um, Every time I say it, I should not have any issues with that. Can everybody see? Um, excellent. 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 Um, so we're talking about Unitarian Universalists being at the vanguard um, of this end of life options movement. Um, and one of the things I love to start with is this quote, life is meaningful because it is a story and in stories, endings matter. Um, and that just, that quote by Atul Gawande in Being Mortal always speaks to me. Um, 
because endings really do matter. And um, as Pablo said, I uh, was a hospice chaplain for many years and I would see people have these very, um, yeah, just loving, um, deep re relationships. And then just always when I would do follow-up bereavement calls, be like, I wish my loved one's death hadn't been that way. Or I wish they had had more choice or agency over how, how they died. And I just really came to see how much our endings do matter. Um, and I just want to take a minute to a pers personal privilege for, and reflect on my own uh, at the Vanguard moment with uh, Unitarian Universalists. So um, even before I knew about UU history with medical aid and dying, I was just a little baby hospice chaplain right out of seminary. And I was armed with all of these books about um, what dying people want, final gifts, all these things. And so I honestly thought I was gonna have all of these like hallmark moments at the bedside um, that we are just gonna have all these reconciliation moments. I'm gonna curate these spiritual spaces. And what I found out is that most people are not having conversations about end of life prior to a hospice admission or prior to a difficult diagnosis or prior to a crisis. So what I spent so much of my time with is helping families through the logistics of death, helping people make decisions. And so I got in my mind, how do we have these conversations prior to the time that we need to have them? How can I facilitate these in my faith community? So starting where we start all things, I started with a Google search and I found this wonderful curriculum, uh, Facing Death with Life um, from the Unitarian Universalist uh, Association. And I wanna find the authors of this curriculum and just send them my love. I owe them money. I owe them my undying gratitude because it was just, it has completely shifted the way I think about how we go about end of life planning. Um, it has really, so I started facilitating these conversations about how we, how do we talk about this in community? And it was such a gift for me, like, um, because I saw that like, our culture has really made end of life planning this very legalistic, financial, um, medical process. But at its heart, it's really a process about community and justice and joy and spirituality and affirming our life in the here and now. And so once I started facilitating these conversations using this curriculum, I was just like, this is how we should always talk about end of life planning. Um, and it really just opened up so much for me. And then as a, this is just another like departure around the same time that I discovered this curriculum, um, we dealt with a tragedy in my, my own family and um, my sister-in-law died unexpectedly. And we adopted my nephew, who was 13 at the time. And so um, in addition to all the grief and trauma and loss of losing his mother, we're also like, all we have is four-legged four dependents at this point. So how do I raise a 13-year-old boy? Around the same time, um, my church started doing our whole lives. And so I will be forever grateful for that conversation, giving me the language um, and the community around how to talk to se about sexuality um, to a 13 year old boy who's now 21 now um, and grown up very well. But um, I just remember the, just learning how powerful um, it can be to talk about um, community. Um, to, to have community, to have these conversations, to give you language um, and to, to do these things. And so this is where, yeah, definitely at the vanguard of my thinking. So I think about facing death with life almost every time I present um, around end of life um, issues, which is now through my job with Compassion Choices is all the time. Um, and where am I? Okay. All right. Um, I want to start with First Unitarian Church of Portland, Oregon. Um, I think the mythos of so many of tech companies is that they all start in a garage. And I am of the um, 
of the idea that movements, a lot of movements are in church basements and end of life options movement is no different. Um, the church, the first Unitarian church of Portland, Oregon, I was just reading this article and it, they, so many times they stressed that it was like in a dilapidated office that they were drafting uh, of the church basement, that they were drafting um, legislation and um, just really meeting around what does it mean to have death with dignity? What does, you know, how, how do we do this? How do we pass this, this legislation? How do we think about this? How do we present this to communities? And Compassion and Choice Choices are, um, one of our founders and our former um, executive director, Barbara Coombs Lee, was a member of First Unitarian Church of Portland, Oregon. And um, she was part of these conversations um, as a nurse and a lawyer and all of these things, bringing this together with so many volunteers and supporters who continue to be like have a profound impact on our um, movement now. Um, and so then we move, as Reverend Ashley said, to the 1988 uh, general resolution. And I will say um, the Unitarian Universalists are still the only mainline denomination that have a statement affirming medical aid and dying and the right to die with dignity. Um, and we are we are seeing, as, as I continue to talk, we're going to see that there there is there's momentum started, but I just the forward thinking, um, that the Unitarian Universalist Association at that time had was just amazing to me and continues to be and very, very inspiring. When I, we're always like 1988, um, so many, and it's been, it's so much a part of so many of the, of the UU congregations um, that I visit and that I speak with, they're like, of course, it's always been that way. Um, and in so many denominations, that is not the case. So we have 1988, uh, the general resolution. Around that time and continuing on to 94, we have the, the work in the church basement and beyond. And so we have the um, death with dignity law that passed in Oregon in 1994. And then it took 14 years um, for the next state. And now we have a little bit of momentum um, with Washington and Montana and Vermont and California and Colorado, DC, Hawaii, New Jersey, Maine and New Mexico and hot off the presses. This literally happened today, just a few minutes ago. I mean, just maybe a few hours ago, um, a med the medical aid and dying bill passed in Delaware. And so if the governor signs it, that'll be one more state um, that um, is authorized with medical aid and dying. And so it's just amazing to see kind of the state of play and how this is happening. So currently, medical aid and dying is available in 11 jurisdictions and one, of one in five adults are living in a state where they have the right to access medical aid and dying. And the momentum continues. Um, this year, 19 states introduced legislation to authorize medical aid and dying. Oh, I'm going too fast here. Um, the dark blue states are the states that are authorized currently. Uh, the teal states are states where there was a bill introduced and Colorado is in yellow because there was just, just this year passed, um, it wasn't already an authorized state, but um, they just passed um, legislation to improve the, um, to improve the legislation, to um, to make it more accessible to people. So now um, nurse practitioners um, can prescribe as well as they've shortened the waiting period from 15 days to seven days um, so that more people, so people are able to access uh, medical aid and dying. I'm realizing that I'm, I think I have a slide that goes in de detail about what medical aid and dying is just so that we can, um, cause I started right there, um, but I'm gonna make sure I talk about that too. Uh, why state by state? Um, this is this is a question that comes up a lot. Um, in 1997, there were two state two states brought cases to the Supreme Court, Washington State and New York. And at that time, uh, the Sup Supreme Court declined to create um, 
to make it a, a federal constitutional right um, to access medical aid and dying, but invited the states to um, to decide it at a state by state level. And so that is where we are when it comes to medical aid and dying access. But we are seeing that so many Americans support medical aid and dying across um, party, which is amazing, um, across faith, uh, across racial lines. And this is a poll from 2020. Um, so not super recent, but also not super old. Um, and so we are commissioning some new um, studies because people are imagining that even more people are supporting medical aid and dying at this point. It's a rare uh, unifying issue in partisan time, as you can kind of see. Um, there are lots and lots of folks, 68% uh, of Republicans, 70% of Democrats, 63% of independents. Um, by race, there's a lot of support. Uh, by religion, there is a lot of, lot of support. And what I find is that the more we talk about it, the more people are like, okay, I often go into faith communities that are like, we would never support that. Um, but then I realized that there's a lot of misinformation um, about it. And once I explain what the authorization really is, um, there's a lot more support for them, uh, support for it. So we are very hopeful that we will continue um, to just gain support in this movement. And 67% of people, this is a 2021 um, survey, said that they would personally want the option of medical aid in dying. Um, and this is, you can kind of see where, um, where people are, um, where Western voters, North Central voters, Midwest voters, Northeast voters, Southern voters, Southwest. And I don't think I told you all where, where I am. I'm in, um, Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and I saw a few Georgians, um, in the, in the chat. Um, and so this is where it's been amazing. Even in, I said for so long, like, We'll never have any movement in Georgia. And just recently, our uh, state medical association has moved from um, an against stance to medical aid and dying to a neutral stance, which is a major shift. What we have, we find is that um, where medical aid and dying is available, there is improvement in end of life care writ large. Um, better use of hospice care. There are improved end of life care conversations and better healthcare provider training. And what I find is that this is a lot like uh, the work we do in reproductive justice. When people have access to the full spectrum of reproductive options, the care for everyone, for all pregnant people, for everyone with a uterus greatly improves. And we are finding the same, the research is pointing to the same thing when, when um, medical aid and dying is authorized. It improves communication and improves training among healthcare providers, all of this. Um, it just lifts up the conversation. And so everybody's able to get um, better care regardless of if one decides to access the law or not. And so a very small pop, uh, percentage of the population will likely access medical aid and dying, but it really does improve care for everyone. So Compassion and Choices, I'll talk, I'll talk a little bit about the organization that I work for, and we're the nation's oldest and largest and most active consumer-based nonprofit working to improve care, expand options, and empower everyone to chart their end-of-life journey. Um, and a lot of our work goes far beyond medical aid and dying. Um, we, our goals are really around healthcare equity at the end of life, which impacts everybody, dementia end of life care, really encouraging people to have conversations about the deaths that they want and what they want their end of life to be before a dementia diagnosis and making sure that that's supported and also expanding access to medical aid and dying. As I said, it's just one, medical aid and dying is just one consideration um, about end of life care. Um, Many people and organizations support end of life planning and care for their loved ones and communities. When I first started this work, I heard a lot 
there are a lot of faith communities that will not allow you to come because you're associated with compassion and choices and we're associated with medical aid and dying. And what I have found is that I just have not been, there has been really no faith community that said, do not bring in information about end of life planning. Do not bring in information about advanced care planning. Everywhere I go, people are like, oh, I really, I've been meaning to fill out that advanced directive, or I've been meaning to think about this um, and really, really appreciate the focus on that. Um, and so there are communities that I go in where I don't talk explicitly about medical aid and dying, but I do talk about hospice care. I talk about palliative care. I talk about advanced directive. I talk about the research that says it's so important to have a healthcare proxy. Who will speak for you if you can't speak for yourself? And so taking people through the full range of end of life options has been really um, welcomed by most of the faith communities that I work with. And um, Compassion and Choices, we have leadership councils in each of these communities who really set forth our agenda and we tailor resources. So we have um, an African-American leadership um, council. We have a Hispanic uh, Latino engagement council. We have um, our Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander um, leadership council. We have a disability um, community leadership council. We have an LGBTQ plus leadership council, and we have a faith leaders for compassion um, council who are all about how are we driving these work? What is our messaging? How are we talking about it? What resources do we have available? What is the research saying about end of life in these particular communities? What are the what are the inequities that we need to be addressing beyond medical aid and dying? Um, and so that has been really important and to, to have these community leaders who really direct our work. Um, and I'm on the community engagement team. And so, so much of our work is just driven by our advocates and our supporters and our storytellers who are like, this is what you need to be talking about. And this is how I think about end of life. And so that has been really powerful to shape our whole community, uh, Compassion and Choices whole work as an organization. I'm going to chat a little bit. I'm realizing that I did not talk to you uh, at, uh, about um, what actually medical aid and dying is. So I'm going to make sure I put up a slide about that. Um, but before, maybe it is in here. Um, but I wanted to also talk about the federal work that we're doing. What are we doing nationally? Um, one of the um, bills that we're really supporting and really hoping gets introduced is um, when medical aid and dying um, was first passed in Oregon, um, there was Congress responded by prohibiting the use of federal funds for any medical aid and dying um, prescriptions, care, all of that. And so um, we are really fighting hard to get that repealed and have the Patient Access End of Life Act. And that is all about how are we having people be able to access it through Medicaid, Medicare, through federal dollars. Um, we have found it can be an, an expensive prescription. Um, and some people um, who have reached out to us and been like, we just cannot afford it. We don't have, our insurance is not covering it. Um, and so I've had to do a GoFundMe for it, or I've had to um, reach out to friends and family. And so that just really should not happen. We really want everyone to be able to access um, this this right, this um, right to a death, a dignified death in the way that they choose. The other things that we are looking um, at is the Health Equity and Accountability Act. Um, and that bill is to ensure that communities who face health inequities receive health services they need. The Compassionate Care Act. Um, and this is all about physician education and public awareness. Um, around advanced care planning, improved access, you're seeing a theme here, improved access to advanced care planning act. Um, this proposed bill would expand providers that can bill Medicare um, for the coverage advanced care planning to, to include clinical social workers. The do not harm act, um, all it's related to referrals, provisions, coverage for healthcare items, such as end of life care and the palliative care and hospice education training act. Um, 
And this bill increases the number of faculty at accredited palliative care schools. And what we are finding, um, which is really fascinating to me, we, because at Compassionate Choices, we talk so much about the importance of having an advanced directive. Um, and what we're finding, what the research is saying that is that what really um, impacts outcomes at the end of life is how well-trained your medical team is. And so if your advanced directive is respected or not, is really all determined by how well-trained your healthcare, um, end-of-life healthcare team is. And so um, we have really been putting a lot of our resources into training um, and education for our healthcare workers because there are things that are in our control and then there are things that are not in our control because we are dependent on how well-trained and educated um, are the healthcare providers who um, care for us are. And so that's been a lot of what um, we've been talking about. These are some things that are coming up um, and I will put these in the, I'll put these links in the chat once we do the, um, once I come off sc shared screen um, so that you can have access to these. But um, we're doing a train the advocate on how to effectively engage faith communities. Um, and I'll be doing that training along with, we have a Harvard Divinity School fellow um, and we'll be doing that training around what, how do we talk to this, talk about these issues with our faith communities. We also have a train the advocate coming up um, that's all about navigating ambiguous loss and the myth of closure with Dr. Pauline Boss. And I am just such a huge fan of Dr. Boss. Um, her book, Ambiguous Loss, uh, was really important for me as a chaplain um, and in my own grief journeys. And so I'm really excited about those coming up and I'll put stick those links in the chat as well. And then also just staying in touch. These have these are all the things, all the ways to stay in touch. And I'll make sure you get all this information. But really, the most important thing is my email address. I really love working with faith communities around these issues. I love giving you the resources that you need. And so my email is zregis at compassionandchoices.org. Um, and so I would love, love, love to stay in touch um, and keep you connected to our faith work. Also, I would love for you to join our Faith Leaders for Compassion if that's something that you feel led to do. Um, it's not just clergy. Um, we have a wide variety of people who are just leaders in their, in their respective faith communities in a variety of ways. Um, and so I would love for you to join our Faith Leaders for Compassion. We do all kinds of, of work together, really setting our agenda. We also have a very kind of a clergy to clergy consultation program where clergy can reach out um, or faith leaders can reach out and say, I'm having trouble talking about this particular thing. How do you talk about this in your uh, faith community? We do trainings. Um, we also have legislative actions that we do together. So if you are interested in that at all, please reach out. I'll put that in the chat. Um, and then also please follow us on social if, if you feel moved. And I'm realizing I have completely left the, the slide out. I thought I would get to it. Um, but I do want to go back and talk about what medical aid and dying is because I don't want to assume that everybody knows what that is. Um, I'm going to stop this share briefly and bring up a bring up the slide I thought I included so that you can see um, what exactly medical aid and dying is. Give me one second. I don't know how I managed to do that. Okay, I'll just go off the dome. I'm like, I had I had a whole slide that I was just being too smart um, for my own good um, and somehow managed to delete. Okay, here we go. 
I'm going to share again. My apologies, everyone. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay. So medical aid and dying, I just wanted to make sure we were all, um, everybody knows what that is, allows terminally ill um, adults to request and receive a prescription for medication that they may choose to bring about a peaceful death. And so to be eligible, an individual must meet four criteria. And this is in all of the laws that were drafted um, very thoughtfully based on the Oregon law that happened in the uh, first Unitarian basement, um, be an adult 18 years or older, be terminally ill with a prognosis of six months or less to live, be mentally capable and be able to self ingest. Um, and I just always think it's important to really outline what an authorization looks like um, because there can be a lot of misinformation about what it looks like. And so this is what, this is medical aid in dying. Um, and dying. There, um, what we're doing, we're doing a lot of access campaigns around how can people access this. One that I mentioned was how can it be affordable for people if they do wish to access this option. Also, um, what is the waiting period? Um, I did a workshop recently on um, the bereavement, bereavement after medical aid and dying. And what so many people brought up is that it can be very difficult because trying to get a pharmacy that actually prescribes the medication. Um, this one woman described her mother had chosen to do medical aid and dying. And she said, I was just in the logistics, like making sure that I got the prescription, making sure that I could find a prescription um, that, I mean, find a pharmacy that would fill the prescription. Um, the hospice team was uncomfortable with it. And so um, her mother was discharged from hospice. So she said, I had to do it all myself. And so we're, we really, we're really, to, even in the states where it's authorized, it's not always accessible. And so that is um, one of the things that we're really um, looking to do is to make it more accessible everywhere for people who wish to take that option. All right, I'm going to stop share. Uh, I've been talking for a long time and I see there's activity in the chat. So I want to make sure that I have time to answer questions and talk with you. Thank you so much, um, Zena. I found that to be an informative presentation. And boy, don't I know it when, some, when you know, when, when you need the technology to work for you, it just <laughs> the gremlins come out to play. Uh, but we, we won't hold that against you. It was a great presentation and rather informative. And I, as somebody who works in public policy, I love to see data, I love to see polls, and I'm excited to hear that you're going to do some of that uh, survey work again, because it always needs to be updated. But I do now want to invite folks who are feeling brave to raise, best if you could raise your electronic hand, otherwise I can't guarantee that I will see you. And then I would like to recognize you and invite you to make it to to, to render a question, I would prefer that we don't do too many statements because we want to hear what Zena has to say. And I would also ask you to respect each other's opinions about these issues. Um, there is a great difference of opinion around some of these questions, but as Zena has indicated, it's mostly a, a lack of information. So with that, I see several hands popping up. And I would like to recognize Terry Wiggins. Terry, please ask your question. Um, hi, thank you for the presentation. Um, my um, <clears throat> comment is this is as long as you're talking about end of life issues, I wonder if you would be willing to also consider in your programs the the issue of the uh, what some might call the high cost of dying with um, um, and after death, the caskets and the funerals and all, and all of that. I'm, I'm a big advocate for green burial. Um, and I would hope you would consider mentioning that in your presentations. Thank you so much for that, Terry. And that is really close to my heart 
as well. I'm on the Funeral Consumers Alliance mm -hmm. of Georgia board. Um, and we deal with issues like that around that all the time. So that's so important to include. Thank you for lifting that up because right. what we have found in Georgia is that it's really difficult. It can be difficult for people to, it's a uniquely, well, not even Georgia everywhere, but it's a uniquely vulnerable time for people. And people often feel um, and not even feel they are taken advantage um, of at that time. And so really having more transparency in the funeral industry is important. So thank you. Absolutely. Um, and Compassion and Choices as an organization has um, typically stayed away from end of life disposition issues, but more and more we are seeing that it is an equity and justice issue in so many ways. And so we are more and more, our legal and policy team is getting involved um, with legal cases around um, end of life um, after death disposition issues. Thanks so much for that question, Terry, and answer, Zena. Diana, or Diane. Hi, I just wanted to ask for you to explain to us what compassion and care is and what your role is. And my yeah. other question is, are you representing UUA or your organization? Yes, great question. Thank you, Diane. Um, Representing Compassion and Choices and just a huge, huge fan of UUA um, and all that you have done in this movement. And Compassion and Choices is a nonprofit organization. We're the oldest, largest, and most active nonprofit dedicated to end-of-life issues. Um, and my role there is I'm the director of faith engagement. So I get to work with faith communities all over the nation um, around these issues. Thank you. Thanks so much. Dr. Zareen. Yeah, you should come off mute. Yes. There we go. Thank you for the presentation. I'm going to ask you about an aspect which is a little different, but very related. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are. <clears throat> my experience with my 94-year-old husband who passed away last year, was the medical community and maybe even some of the faith community were more coaxing us to consider letting the life end. I mean, Massachusetts, it's not one of the places where you can make your life end. So my passion for the rest of my life is to stop people from encouraging their loved ones to be allowed to die when the loved one and the people who love them don't want them to die. So the medical community, if it has license with this, would come at people even stronger and induce them to die. It was just, they didn't want Medicare saying, why are you wasting so much money trying to prolong the person's life? And that's not compassion or care, I feel. Absolutely, thank you so much for um, lifting that up, Dr. Zareen. I often say in our work, charting your own end of life journey, one of the things that, um, let me make sure there are not too many compassion choices people um, on the audience because I don't want them to be mad at me. But um, one of the things that I talk about often is that in many of the communities I work at, deceleration of care, let me not be so clinical in language, but like taking away care is not a dignified death, is not a compassionate death. Um, I have many people um, close to me in my life who say, I have a healthcare system who has never been attentive to my needs and to my health and to my care. And so for you to tell me like the most caring thing is to get less care does not feel like the caring and dignified option for me. And so one of the big exactly. things is how defining your own personal definition of a dignified death is so personal. Um, and that I really want all of us in the end of life space to be more respectful 
of, of that. Um, I have a very close friend whose mom is 97. And she said, every time she takes her mom to the doctor, the doctor starts with, well, you know, she's 97. And she's like, I just want to cuss them out yeah. because that is not, that doesn't not need to be where the conversation starts. I want my mom to get good care and compassionate care, no matter what age she is. And so thank you so much for lifting that up. I did not mention that, but that is a big thing that I talk about um, when I'm training doulas and chaplains um, and people in the palliative care space is that people get to define for themselves what is a dignified death. Um, and that does not, and just because you say, oh, I'm dying at home is not always the best place for people to die or even people entering hospice care when they're not ready to do that is not always the best way. And so thank you so much. for. I want to insert. Oh, sorry. Wouldn't passing this law give more freedom to the medical community to allow people to die or practically kill them. You don't have to go on about it, but thank you for understanding. Yeah, I absolutely understand. And what we found, I'll just very, very quickly, is that um, it's it's almost crazy to say, but we have not um, had, there have been no documented and um, verified cases of physicians pushing this option on on um, on people and patients. And so we really, that's such a big part of our education. We don't ever want people to feel like they are. This is an option they have to bring up. And that's how we always train um, physicians and nurse practitioners is this is something that patients have to ask for. It cannot be something that's ever, it has to be patient directed. It can never be physician directed. I, wanna, already, I think uh, I'm next. I already had muted and I'm next. Yes, Mary Jo, but I'm okay. the MC for the evening in charge of all the questions. So I'm going to exert some some privilege here and say there's an important conversation I'm play, playing out in the in the chat. And I just want to ask, Zena, do you, do you have any comments about how to engage? Um, because you said in your presentation, you said that there's support across racial, racial groups, r religious groups. Do you have any thoughts on how to engage uh, communities of color, especially legislators of color on this issue? Because apparently in the great state of Maryland, there's some reticence among the African-American members of the legislature. And I would imagine, based on what I know, that that's a dynamic that does play out in other state legislatures. So could you talk to us for one minute about that? And then we'll kick it over to Mary Jo. Oh, you're on mute. I'm muted. Uh, yes, absolutely. I'll make it very, very quick, but you are absolutely right. Um, I actually work very closely with the pastor we just met today, who is in Maryland, um, who we are always, who's a African-American Baptist preacher, who we're always like, can you go talk to this legislator, please? Um, but what we are finding is that um, it has to be a conversation that is in these communities. And that's why we work so hard with our leadership council. I just was speaking with a professor at a medical school in Virginia, and she was sharing like around most issues, she has a council, a faith council around, um, a, she has an African-American faith council. She also has an, an HBCU council. Um, she has like African-American engaged um organizations who are all doing research about this these topics to make sure that it's, it's something that's coming from the community and not placed on the community. And so that is what we really work hard for is Compassion and Choices is amplifying the voices of support um, in these communities, especially the African-American community in Maryland, um, who are supportive and really walking through all the misinformation. Because often when we meet with the um, with people who are against it, there is still some misinformation happening about um, who's going to receive it. And 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 they are very um, salient points as far as when you look at the health inequity in our culture, like it makes sense that there is some reticence um, for this um, bill. And so a lot of it is about um, bringing up the misinformation and helping people walk, walk through that. And so we do, we have a very active um, African-American Leadership Council who is very active in Maryland trying to counter some of these things. 
Thank you so much, Gina. So I'm keeping an eye on the clock and I want to honor everybody's time. So the stack is going to be closed. So it'll go Mary Jo, Barbara, and then Steve. And then we are going to hear from Reverend Ashley if we haven't lost her. Okay. So please try to be succinct. Thank you. Uh, yes, I'll be very short. I wanted to suggest that you might also let people know of the option of stopping to eat and drink. They can be kept, they can be kept comfortable with that. And some people's religious commitments might not let them directly kill themselves, but they would let them withdraw that support of eating and drinking. So I think it would be helpful to be sure that people are aware of that option also. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mary Jo. Very, very quickly. I, I think you're so right. I debated putting uh, VSED slides in this presentation because I, I knew we had a short time, but you are very correct. And I actually just met um, with a Unitarian Universalist here in um, Georgia who was telling me that she helped her mother through uh, VSED. And she said her mother referred to it as terminal fasting. And I thought that was very um, that was just language I hadn't heard before. And it, it's just, it's got me thinking about VSET in a different way. And she talked about the support of her family and her faith community in that. So I, I think you're right that VSET is, is an important part of this conversation. Barbara, please come off mute and ask her. Yeah, thank you. I'm in, uh, my, my question is personal. I'm in Vermont and I'm getting ready to do my advanced directive. And I um, I see the importance of the agent, the healthcare agent, who is my son. He doesn't want to talk about this. Uh, I'm completely ready to talk about it. How, what kind of advice or how, how would you, in a, if you were counseling a family, how would you approach that problem? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you so much for that question, Barbara. Um, first, and I did not mention this in the presentation, but we have an we have an end of life consultation hot warm line. It's not they said don't say hotline, warm line. Um, and it's at compassion and choices um slash EOLC. Um Dot org And they are people who, if you call and leave a message, just as you're working through it, and if you have any questions, that is their job to help you work through it. Um, but so just with any like legalities or anything like that, that is their whole work. Um, and they are amazing at that. Um, but the, the larger question you asked is how to talk about it, because it happens so often people I did this, I do this work. And when my father wanted to talk about his will, I was kind of like, you're not going anywhere. Why, why, no. Um, and it brings up our own feelings of mortality. And so what I always say is invite people in, in the sense of saying, this is what I'm doing. And this is, I. there's nothing wrong with me. I just want to have, I want to give this to you as an act of love so that you are not dealing with this in a time of crisis. So you're not making decisions um, when you are actively grieving um, a diagnosis I've had or, um, or, or my death or my incapacity. And so that is one of the things that I, I, I really encourage people to, is just to frame it like that, because having to make these decisions when the person that you love is at the end of life is so difficult. Um, and that's what I found in hospice care. So just inviting your son along to say, I am doing this and I would love for you to be a part of this, but also at the same time, understanding if if this is too hard for you, do I need to have another healthcare proxy? And most of the time people are like, no, I love you. I wanna be that person. But if they, but if it's something they can't do, always knowing that it, you don't love them less because they are not your person, but maybe they just are not equipped to, to be in that role. Steve, please go for it. Thank you. Actually, my real name is Jack Stiefel. Zena, thank you for your presentation. I have a practical question. You you mentioned five criteria to qualify for prescription, for example, to aid in death with dignity. Five criteria, one of which was mental capacity. Yes. It seems like that criteria could potentially disqualify a lot of people who prior to their being becoming mentally incapacitated 
would previously have liked to have had that option. Is there a mechanism available for people to specify their wishes prior to their becoming mentally incapacitated that would allow them to qualify for death with dignity? So, and, and, and Zena, I want to add something which, which came up in the chat sort of related to this, which is the dementia issue. You mentioned dimen dementia a couple of times in your presentation, and that's an excluded category in Washington, D.C., so there have been some questions directed at me about, about that. Yes, and that's such a good question. Yes, dementia is excluded everywhere, but what there is a, and I am, ah, oh, Vanessa, you are amazing. Thank you for putting those in the chat, the Compassion Choice, this is EOLC, Finish Strong Tools. Thank you, thank you, Vanessa. Um, how we, how we're thinking about the dementia issue is um, having people make decisions prior to that and they cannot act, opt to do medical aid in dying if they are diagnosed with dementia. But what can happen is you can map out any, uh, your own deceleration of care. So it's not the dementia, but if you're saying like, I don't want this treated, you can do that prior um, to a dementia diagnosis. And so that is what we are really, that's why we're encouraging the conversation way before a diagnosis or a crisis. Um, what we have found is that um, there are people who said like, if I get dementia, I don't want, like don't treat these certain things. Um, and the families have found so much um, comfort in knowing that before the dementia diagnosis, while they were fully um, while they were fully themselves in that way, they made these decisions. And so that's one of the things that we have been. So there's a dementia provisions tool that is on our website that walks you through how to have these conversations with your family and has you talk through what, like if I, if I have dementia and I'm not able to do this, what care do I want to continue on for me? Do I want infections treated? at that time, if, you know, all these things, it just allows you to have that conversation right now. I know we're, we're running low on time, but please, I'm going to put my email in the chat and um, I would love to stay in touch um, about any of these things. And uh, my favorite thing to do is to have workshops at congregations where we go through your, your state's advanced directive um, so that we can talk through every issue because they can be different state by state. And so that, that can be a really helpful thing to get people to do. And with that, I invite Reverend Ashley, if Reverend Ashley is still with us, I'm hunting. Yes, there you go. So I'm gonna make Reverend Ash, oh, Paula, you need to do it for me. I don't have that control. Thank you so much, Zena. We appreciate you. We appreciate the time you gave to us. And now I welcome Reverend Ashley to uh, extinguish our chalice and say a closing. Thank you. Friends, lighting a candle is somewhat like the beginning of life. If that is true, then perhaps Extinguishing a candle is like the ending of life. But death may not be the end of us. We live on in the memories of friends and loved ones. The influence we possess in life works on moving persons and causes forward. And let us not forget that most candles have more than one life. And so perhaps may we. As we leave this space today, May we do so with each other in our hearts. As we leave, may we too seek to be at the vanguard. May we continue the legacy that started in a church basement in Portland. The legacy that continues this day in Delaware. The legacy that goes forth with so many states on the precipice of passing legislation such as medical aid and dying. May we lift up the various end of life options so that all people may know what's possible for them as their lives wind down. Now that we know what we know, let us be the ones to educate others. 
Let us be the ones to consider and start the conversations so that people are empowered to make choices for themselves. And so end of life options don't come up for the first time as someone is dying. Let us be the ones to help others work through this process and find the strength to just talk. Let us be the ones who advocate for legislation that gives all people all the choices possible in their deaths. Let us be the ones seeking justice, advocating for equity, and offering support to those who need it the most. As we extinguish this flame, May the flame in our hearts move us to love, move us to speak, move us to act. Let us leave here tonight connected, inspired, and ready. Thank you so much, Reverend Ashley. Thank you so much, Zena. Now, for those of you who are accustomed to UUSJ, you'll know that we do what I call a soft close. We invite anybody that has a family matter or you know, a bodily matter to go and attend to that. We don't wanna hold you, but we do know from many years of doing sessions that people sometimes benefit from processing a little bit together. Sort of like after services at church, you go to the coffee hour, you find a friend, you get a cup of coffee and you chit chat about what you just heard or what you should have heard, but didn't actually hear until your friend tells you what you, you missed. Um, bad church joke, I'm sorry. Uh, but, but you know, at UUSJ, we have a culture of this warm and lingering goodbye. And it's an opportunity for you to ask questions or now is a great time to make a statement. But Zena, thank you so much. You don't have to feel compelled to stay. Reverend Ashley, thank you so much. You don't have to feel compelled to stay. If you want to, cool, cool beans. We love you. We think you did a great job for us to, this evening, but it's not in any way obligatory. Um, and with that in mind, I guess I want to invite, does anybody have questions that either they want to for me to answer about UUSJ or any, any thoughts on your heart uh, regarding the presentation we heard from Zena? If not, I can simply hold a moment of relative silence and we can just look at each other's 